Welcome to the Who God Says podcast. I am your host and Kingdom Ambassador, Ty Chandra. Hi, hi, hi. Are you saying hi to me? <laughs> everyone. Oh, okay. Hi, hi, everyone. <laughs> Today we have a very special guest. We have Reverend Dr. David Chaka. He is a founder and director of Spirit Equip Ministries. Oh my God, he's a writer. He's a chairman of Alliance Pray Team. Like, you have so many accolades. I am so honored that you are here. Well, it's a joy to be here today, and uh, I'm just thankful for the great opportunity. Yes, God. I was like, oh, my God. So today, we're going to do this um, session a little bit different. Um, I wanted us to have an open conversation about your book. So you have a book that's coming up. Can you show the people your book? Sure. This is, yeah, this is the book. It just got published by Whitaker House. Now it's kind of full on the screen here. It's called Healing Prayer, God's Idea for Restoring Body, Mind, and Spirit. It's a co-write. Mm-hmm. Uh, the president of, the former president of Asbury Theological Seminary is my co-author. His name is Dr. Maxie Dunham. And Maxie and I, he, he is a prayer mobilizer in Methodism. He has written a beautiful book called The Workbook of Living Prayer. And that book taught me to pray way back <laughs> back in the day and so i never dreamed i'd meet him but uh, we have become friends and he actually was the second reader in my doctoral work i met many of his friends and the result is we started to co-write wow. and so we wrote this book on healing prayer and it's being it's just been released on november 21 just before the american thanksgiving Ooh. and uh, the goal is to teach churches and individuals how to develop teams for healing prayer, how to be open to the power of the Lord in healing prayer, how to recognize the signals when God's trying to get your attention about healing prayer and those kinds of things. So that's all all in that book. It's published by Whitaker House and it's just out and you can get it wherever books are sold. Awesome. Okay, so so it was a co-write. So what made you say, how did it just come about? What made you say, let's- Oh, that's a very long story. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so as it turns out, um, a Maxi uh, became my friend when I, th- there's a very long call story attached to this, <laughs> but I'll back this up to how I started to do healing prayer. I, I mean, okay. it began this way. Um, I was a seminary student back in the day. So we're talking quite a long time ago. I don't <laughs> want to tell you my exact age. <laughs> At any rate, I was... It, I was in a seminary where there were people with mixed convictions. And sometimes there were people who are, have what you call evangelical convictions. And sometimes there were people who had what you call liberal convictions. Mm-hmm. And I was a Bible thumping, Bible believing, born again believer. I love the scripture. I believe it's the word of God written. And whatever the Bible says, I am required to do if it's at all within my power and ability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the hope of the new. <laughs> Carry on. Anyway, some of the students in the class did not hold the view and some of the professors did not. And if I go to a class and somebody would say, oh, by the way, that miracle probably didn't happen. I would say, oh, wait a minute. I don't think that's true. I believe that the scripture is true, et cetera. And there was a guy in the class and he could have been a stand-up comic. He was a radio guy who had this ability to be able to take anything you say and turn it into a magnificent and colossal humorous moment. So everybody in the class would burst into the gales of uproarious laughter. So one time I was defending the historicity of a miracle in the New Mm. Testament and somebody said that wasn't the case. And then this guy told this joke and everybody in the room burst into gales of laughter, (laughs) but it was mocking my view. It was making fun of my view that the Bible is reliable, that the Bible is historical, that the Bible says things that really happened, et cetera. It was kind of an anti-supernaturalist view that this student had. Anyway, bottom line was uh, anytime I would do that, in the presence of our peers, this when the guy was in the room, he would lob these jokes across the room and everybody would laugh. But I was usually the object of the humor. Mm-hmm. And in the course of time, you know, you laugh it off one or two times, but in the course of time, it starts to hurt. So I said to myself, I'm never going to be that boy's friend. <laughs> 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 now, he had a lovely wife and she was sweet. And when she was there, he was a kind man. And we had a mutual friend. I called her Susie in the book. And uh, whenever she was around, uh, he would hesitate before he got into one of these modes where he'd start Mm. making fun, et cetera. Anyway, uh, there was one time I had a class three times a week. I had to go across the plaza to study New Testament Greek. And and so I was going across this plaza. And the mutual friend, who's very sweet, saw me. 
she stopped me and she said, hey, David, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm fine going to my Greek class. And she said, oh, did you know that our friend's in the hospital? I said, uh, what for? And she said, he's got <laughs> phobitis. Actually, I didn't, I, I, I didn't know how serious it was. And I didn't feel bad that he was in the hospital. It's a wrong thing. I just read Romans 12 about, no, never taking your own revenge. Anyway, the point is I had to repent immediately of my bad attitude. And then she said he has phlebitis. I said, what's that? She said, there is a clot in his arm. Mm. It's in a vein. If it's in your leg, it's called deep vein thrombosis. If it's in your arm, it's called uh, phlebitis. Mm -hmm. But if the clot breaks free and it travels through your system, it hits your lung or brain, 95 times out of 100, you're dead. Wow. You die. And it's a, it's a very serious thing. And for the 5% who live, they're forever impaired in their speech or their ability to function. It's just not good news. Anyway, when I realized this, I, I said, well, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Where is he? And she pointed six blocks down the road. We were in the university complex and there was a university hospital there. Mm -hmm. And he was in the university hospital. It was a very fine school. Anyway, bottom line, I said, oh, he's getting good care then. And then she said, yes. I said, well, that's good. And she said, well, he wanted me to ask you something. I said, what's that? And uh, she said, he wants you to come pray for him. <laughs> I said, what? Yeah. And she said, yes, he, he wants you to come pray for him. God, I said, funny. I don't believe it. And she <laughs> said, yeah, it was hard for me to believe too. <laughs> I said, I, I, I don't, I'm not going. And she said, why not? He said, I think he wants to make fun of my faith. I think he wants to mock my convictions. Well, the, the, behind this, Taishankar, there's something else. I had been a Christian believer for eight years, and I had met all kinds of people who understood most of the doctrines of the church, but I'd never met anybody who had been healed by the prayer of faith. I didn't, I'd never been taught in it. It wasn't part of the conversation when I was you know, studying, et cetera. I was in this school that didn't really teach this. I had not a sweet clue about what to do. Right. I knew it was in the scripture, but I didn't know what to do. So here's what happens. I, I said, I'm not going. And she said, and I said, you know, he's been kind of cruel. And she said, he has been. I'll go talk to him. I said, you can talk to him if you want, but I, I don't know if this is, a, this is true. So I went off to my class and the next day. I'm in the coffee lounge in the school. And the mutual friend shows up and she looks at me and she says, oh, I talked to our friend. And he, he apologized profusely. He admitted that he shouldn't have done that to you. And he wants you to come pray. And I said, I'm not going. <laughs> anyway, third day, I'm going across that plaza again. And of course, we intersect one more time. And there she is. Mm -hmm. And she said, did you go to that hospital down the road? And I said, I'm not going. Now, Tyshandra, I don't know if you've ever been told off by your mother. Okay, so <laughs> this girl, got this fire in her eyes. Whenever my mom told me off, she would get her back straight. Fire would come out of her eyes. She'd stomp her foot and she'd insert my middle initial. So this girl knew my middle name. She looked at me. She straightened up her eyes, flash fire. She stopped me. She said, David R. Chotka, aren't you going around this camp and saying the Bible is the word of God is supposed to be obeyed? I said, well, yes. She said, what about this scripture? I was sick and you visited me. Tyshandra, suddenly a fell blow landed in the center of my being. <laughs> that point. I, I knew that I had no choice except to go to see him. And then I looked at my friend and I said, look, it says sick and visited. It doesn't say sick and prayed. <laughs> and she said, well, regardless of that, you got to go. <laughs> so I finished my class and I went to that. It was about six blocks walk. So I didn't have to catch a bus. Right? I just went down the road. I got into the hospital and there he was. And you got to know. You walk into the room and he's got all these monitors on and he's got all these tubes going wow. into him. And, you know, the nurses is coming and checking his pressure and so on and so forth. It's serious. Yeah. And he's white as a ghost. He's sitting on this bed and there's a pile of books on the, on the lunch counter next to him. And uh, I started to talk to him about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I asked him about his classes, how he was keeping up. I said, well, I'm glad you're getting medical care. And I was about to leave and because I, I, I didn't know, honestly, number one, I was afraid. Number two, I didn't know what to do. I had no training. I knew the scripture was true. I knew it. Anyway, the bottom line is this guy looked at me and he said, aren't you, aren't you, aren't you going to pray? I said, you want me to pray? <laughs> and he said, I do. I said, um, just about four days ago, you made fun of me talking about Jesus doing a miraculous healing. Every time I have said anything 
about Moses splitting the sea or Jesus walking on water or Lazarus rising from the grave or anything that's in the Bible where it's not natural. You, you, have made, you have mocked me in front of our peers. I want, why do you want me to pray for you? And this 27-year-old man burst into tears. Wow. He just began to sob. And it was this huge sob. And he said, I am so sorry I did that to you. I am just so sorry. I, I, I am, would you please forgive me? And he said, and I, I am 27 years old and I have phlebitis and I could die. And I don't know anyone else who believes that every miracle in the Bible is true. Won't you please pray that Jesus heal me? And, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? So, <laughs> so in this room now, I'm still terrified because I've never seen it. I've never met anyone and I don't know what to do. Right. right. I've never, I never participated in it. I'd only seen the crazies on television, you know, slapping people on foreheads. And punching <laughs> in the stomach. I'd seen the crazies, but this was not a helpful model. <laughs> so, but I knew that, okay, I remember, okay, Jesus put his hand on people. Mm -hmm. I should probably do this. So I said, could I put my hand on you? He said, sure. I said, where is it? He said, left elbow, just above the, just above the left elbow. Uh, put your hand there. So I did. And I put my other hand on his head and I started to pray. And here is the moment that forever changed my life. I did this out of sheer obedience. I did not have a sweet clue. If the clue was there, it was lonely. I mean, it's just, I had, I had no idea. So I started to pray and I have not, I don't remember a word I said, except I know I said something like Jesus heal this guy, you know, something like that. And as we prayed and it went on for, I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes of praying. Suddenly, the atmosphere in that room changed. It was like the compassion of the Lord had filled the air, and we were inhaling fiery compassion. And inside me, and I've tried to describe this, I don't know if I'm going to do it adequately, but I'll try and give you my best shot at it. It was, I could only focus on him. And I had this fiery presence inside my spirit, burning with fire. And in my mind, I saw the power of the Lord flow through me and I sensed, how do I say this? A gift of faith, absolute total conviction mm -hmm. that this man must be healed for God's glorious goodness sake, married together with a sense of manifest presence. Mm -hmm. That presence expanded inside of me. It went down my arm. It went into his. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, fire presence. What is that? Wow. I said, that's the presence of Jesus of Nazareth. His spirit is giving you a healing. And then, Tashadra, I ran out of the room because I was terrified. <laughs> I, just, I just, number one, I thought he was going to make fun of me. Number two, I had never felt anything like that in my entire life. Right. And I didn't know what to do. So I just ran out. And I, I found out months later that what happened after that, I was w running out and a nurse was walking in. Mm -hmm. And he said to her, Jesus has just healed me. My friend from the oh, school, he wow. came pray for me. I can go home. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, we don't do that around here. We've got to run some tests. Oh, and yeah. he said, we'll run the tests. I think Jesus healed me. My friend just prayed. And he went on at great length about how I'd prayed and how I'd prayed. And so the late nurse finally said, well, you're due for tests anyway. Rolled him oh. down the hallway. They conducted the tests. All the phlebitis in his body was gone not a trace of it. Amen. And so the next day I was in the coffee lounge in the school. Now it was one of those old 19th century buildings with stone columns in the hallway, you know, with those big, you know, mm. things that stick out and, and it has a stone floor. And this, this is an old seminary. So he, I, I saw him in the coffee lounge and he said, come with me. And I said, okay. <laughs> and he shoves me in a corner of one of these, one of these colonnades and looks around in every direction. And then he says that prayer, changed my life. Wow. I said, thank you. And I ran away again. <laughs> <laughs> and what, and then after this, every time I'd go into a class, every time, and I would defend some miracle or some scripture or whatever, he would put the humor gun on unbelief, Glory. not on faith. Glory to God. And for the next series of months, he began to, do and so th this is not in the book. I'm going to tell you the end of the story. So uh, in the, the domination I was serving, we would do eight months of seminary, and then you'd have four months 
in a church, some church somewhere that under the oversight of a pastor. And so he, I, I, got, I was going to have a summer field in some rural location. He sticks his, his, his phone number in my hand and he says, take this. I said, what is it? It's my phone number. I said, okay, what's it for? He said, if you're in trouble, you call. <laughs> And I didn't know what that was about. And listen, I had a beautiful summer. I led some people to the Lord. I, you know, I'd never preached before. I was learning how to preach. I really enjoyed, you know, giving pastoral care to people and so on and so forth. So come back to school in the fall. I actually didn't want to come back to school. <laughs> I loved being in the pastorate so much. It was just so delightfully fun. Anyway, um, there was a party a couple months in and all the students were all together in the same room. We're all doing harmless chat and teasing each other and that kind of thing. And there's the guy. And his wife is beside him and she's nice and sweet. And so also is our shared friend. And I walk up to say hello. And the two girls start giving him the elbow. You know, you got to tell Chotka what happened. Got to tell Chotka what happened. And <laughs> so he said, I don't want to tell Chotka what happened. <laughs> and so finally, in the course of time, he admitted, here's what happened. He was well. Mm -hmm. And he went home after he, he was released from the hospital. Of course, he and his wife were in awe and they both talked about it and they said they thanked the Lord and they went to sleep. And in the night, he awoke to a dream. And in the dream, the Lord spoke to him and said, my servant David defends my word. Anytime he defends my scripture, you must defend him. Wow. And then he looked at me, you know, and of course, the two girls are crying. The tears are coming down his eyes. And he said, the only time I got a phone call from God. It was for you. <laughs> <laughs> so that started my study on prayer for healing. That's, That's how amazing. it began. That's and amazing. So, but I mean, I, I, it, you got to know something. That was not me. I did not want to be there. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it led to a theological principle that I, do, I use for everything that I do. And it's rooted in the experience of being someone who prays. And here is the lesson. God initiates, we respond. Mm. And we're supposed to pay attention to the signals of the Lord's presence and power. Now, here's the reality. Everybody should have a devotional life. Everybody okay. should be reading that Bible every day. Everybody should have your nose in the scripture. And there are, and everybody who's a Christian knows about this. They know those times when the Bible text leaps off the page and grabs your heart. And suddenly you start thinking about that person you have to forgive or that person yeah. you need to forgive or the thing that you need to get done, or the practice of God. There's something like this. Everybody knows about that. It's called guidance. Yep. Now, you do this, and when the Lord is asking you to pray for someone, you pay attention to those signals. And the best signal for this is found in Romans 14, verse 17. It says this, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll just tell you what I now do when I'm doing prayer for healing. Um, invariably, there's somebody sick somewhere. Invariably. When, when you're a pastor, you meet them all the time. They're, they're in a car accident. Somebody's got cancer. Somebody's in emotional distress and they're in anguish and their body's acting up and so on and so forth. You're always praying for them because that's what you do. It's just, it's just the, the ordinary Christian life. When the Lord wants an assignment with prayer for healing, their name will pop into your head from your spirit. Mm. The, your walk with Jesus gets sweeter. That's righteousness. The peace waxes larger and your focus with compassion grows and your joy increases. Mm. And all that you can do is think about that person. Now, in my case, I feel an anointing. Yeah. And I'm going to try and describe it for you, but I don't know if you feel things the way that I do. I'll just tell you. So I don't even know if you see green the way I see green or red. <laughs> the way I, see. I, I know that I have this, we have this common thing called language. Yeah. I'm going to give my best shot at describing it. It's a velvety smooth assurance of warmth in behind my emotional or my physical estate. And it waxes large when there's an assignment on me to pray for another. The peace gets bigger. The fire burns. The presence grows rich. I become aware of Jesus and his compassion. In fact, read the Gospels and you will see compassion was a trigger for Jesus to do miracle again and again and again. Shows up in Mark chapter 1, round verse 40 with the leper. 
the leper comes and says, you know, if you're willing, you could make me clean. And in Mark 1, it says, moved with compassion. He said, I'm willing. And he reached out his hand to heal him and did. Uh, feeding the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000. He sees the people, they're hungry, three days with him. No food in, a, in an isolated place. And the disciples want to send them away. And Jesus says, you feed them. <laughs> They got they got five loaves and two fish. Thank you very much. That's their lunch, right? So <laughs> they're they're not expecting to do that with five thousand people. That's just the men. And they, if they were brought their wives, that's ten thousand. If they brought their kids, there was no birth control. That's twenty five thousand. <laughs> okay, you right. know this. Twenty five, thirty thousand people there. And if your kid's hungry, you know what they say, Mom. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. So, you know, Why, Jesus is teaching me. He sees the crowd. He sees that they're like sheep without a shepherd and move with compassion. Yeah. He feeds the 5,000. You see this signal showing up again and again and again in the ministry of Jesus. So uh, that's really how the search to study prayer for healing began. Wow. And uh, I, there's been many of those occasions. And usually prayer for healing catches me completely by surprise. <laughs> So, you know, you're, you're going about your ordinary duties. You know, you're, you're in the middle of writing your sermon or you're, you're, you're visiting somebody or, you know, you're, you're, you're leading a Bible study. You're at the prayer. You, you do the ordinary until the specific assignment is given. Yeah. So I'll tell you one more that's in the book. All right. There's, um, uh, I was pastoring a church in the city of Chatham, Ontario. Mm -hmm. Chatham is a small city. It's about 40,000 people. And uh, there was a large church there. I was the pastor of that church. And we had a Sunday school workshop. And uh, in the Sunday school workshop was a lady who had come to the Lord like this. So here's what happened. One day I was in my office working and one of the grandmothers in the church, we all called her Grandma Mary. She called me and she said, my granddaughter's child is sick. Is there a pastor who could go and visit the child? And I was on call for visiting that day. So I said, sure, I'll go. So, you know, I, I met Grandma Mary. She drove her car. I drove mine because I had other errands to do after. I go into the house and there's this, uh, there's this, you know, 20 something mom with four kids mm -hmm. and she's holding a babe in arms and the babe is wheezing, like really wheezing mm -hmm. very badly. And I said, Oh, pleased to meet you. Your name is Tammy. She said, yes. And by the way, I have this story written out in her handwritten writing and I have her written permission to tell the story. So this is what happened with this. In fact, I just pulled that the other day so I could see the notes that she made so I'd get the details right. Anyway, here's what happened. She passed me the child. It was wheezing pretty badly, and I was rocking the child to, to go to sleep because I was a young dad myself in those days. And that's what you do when you get a kid, you rock. <laughs> so I put my hand on the child's forehead. I started to pray, little girl. And I just prayed God's blessing on her, and I asked the Lord to make her well. And the kid fell asleep in my arms very gently, very sweetly. And so, you know, I was, you know, doing this rock thing for about five minutes and everybody was smiling and giggling and laughing now because the, the kid was asleep. So I passed the little girl back to her mom and away I went oh, off yeah. to do the rest of my stuff. Anyway, um, that Sunday I was doing an evangelistic message. I felt commanded to, to invite people to say yes to the claims of Christ, to say yes to Jesus as Savior. And she, resp she was there. It was her first time in church. Oh, wow. She said yes to Christ. She got saved that Sunday. Well, two, three months later, I get an appointment. She walks in and she looks at me and she says, Pastor David, is there something I can do to help around the church? I Aww, said, oh, Tammy, do you know the Bible? She said, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, I see. Praise God. You know what, Tyshandra, I, I had an oversized Sunday school class. There was a really good teacher in that Sunday school class with little kids. And it was like 20 kids and she couldn't do crowd control and teach. Yeah. So, but this girl had four kids. I said, oh, you know, kids, <laughs> could you do crowd control in that class while the teacher teaches? Mm -hmm. She said, Pastor David, then I get to learn the Bible too. I said, yes. yes. So she started to help out with this. And it comes the fall time. My wife and I, my wife's a teacher. And she looked at me and she said, you know, we better do a Sunday school teacher's workshop and help those workers and Sunday school teachers. I said, yeah, it's a good idea. So we invited someone to help us out. We set up a day and we had 14 of these volunteers who decided to be part of this. And it was a Saturday morning in November. So here's what happened. We're, we're, the, the Sunday school workshop was supposed to start at nine and we were supposed to open up the doors at eight and the caretaker opened the door at eight and we walk in at 8.30 and there's this mom with a patch on her eye 
white as a ghost and obviously in distress. Mm -hmm. But she's there for the Sunday school teacher's workshop. And we looked at her. And now at this moment, there was uh, there were three or four couples who had walked in. And uh, a couple of them were people doing other things. But, you know, there were people who were attending the, the event. Mm -hmm. One of them was a lady named Barb. And uh, Barb and my wife and I are standing there and we're talking to Tammy. And Tammy said, oh, I said, Tammy, what happened? She said, oh, I got a patch on my eye. My eye's terribly sore. I said, well, we can see that. What happened? She said, well, you know, Pastor David, I don't have a lot of money. I said, yeah, I do know that. She said, well, you know, um, uh, my neighbor and I, we would hand out treats at Halloween on Thursday night. And I said, oh, and she said, yeah, we did. We, I had a neighbor. We do this together. So it was half the cost. But when I looked at the decorations, they were all about evil. All of the decorations that we put up were about Satan and the devil and things that were nasty and ugly and violence and murder. And, and I just felt like Jesus wasn't pleased with that. I said, well, you'd be right about that. And she said, well, I don't believe we should glorify evil. So I made a decision that I would tear down those, those decorations as quickly as I could, as soon as the kids were done and try and figure out what to do next year. I said, well, that's a good thing, Tammy. She said, well, I went outside and started tearing down decorations. And there was one decoration that was anchored to the wall with a tack and a piece of wood. Mm -hmm. And I pulled on it and it flew out of the wall and it went straight into my eye. Wow. And it punctured my cornea and it scratched my cornea and went and hurt my, it actually came out, hit my arm. And I damaged my eye and I screamed and the neighbors got me. It was somewhere around 11 o'clock at night. We got to the hospital and somewhere close to midnight, one side of midnight or the other. The eye doctor in town was on call. He saw me and he said, you have lost 60% of your forward vision in that eye and you've lost 100% of the peripheral. I am going to clean the eye out. We're going to give you a patch for your eye. If the light leaks in, you're going to have some pain, but I'll give you a pain reliever. I'll give you an antibiotic to stop any possible infection. And I'm booking you in to see me on Monday. So this is, you know, that was Friday morning. This is Saturday morning, the next day. And here's this single mom with four kids. Now, Grandma Mary is taking care of those four kids. Uh -huh. She's come for the workshop when she's got this damage. And as we're standing in the hallway, there is this, uh, the lady named Barb, the, the elder's wife. She looks at me and she says, Pastor David, I believe we're supposed to pray for Tammy to be healed. And suddenly uh, there was another lady named Helen. And she said, Absolutely right. And there were two elders there, a guy named Ralph and a guy named Brent. Yeah, we got to do this. My wife said, yeah, we got to do this. So we all went into the room that was booked for the workshop. And by this time, all 14 attendees were there, plus the leaders. And we asked Tammy's permission if we could place our hands on her. And she said, oh, please. So we all put our hands on her. We started to pray. And my hand got fiery hot. That's one of the wow. signals that happens with me. And again, compassion. This, this sense in your spirit that God's glory was at stake. It wasn't just for her. It wasn't just for the room. It wasn't just for me. It was God's glory that was yeah. at stake here because she took a stand for what the Lord wanted her to do. And, you know, so I, we're starting to pray. And, and after several minutes, it was very clear this presence is dominating the room. I said, Tammy, what, what's going on? She said, Pastor David, there's this fiery heat going into my body and it's going into my eyeball and the pain is diminishing. I said, where's the heat coming from? And she tapped five hands. There was mine, there was my wife's, there was Barb's, there was Helen's and there was one of the elders, a guy named Brent. And I said, do, do you want us to keep praying? She said, oh, please. So we did. And then suddenly the presence lifted and we all knew she had no more pain. Wow. And I, she said, she said, what should I do, Pastor? I said, well, let's do the workshop. When are you seeing the doctor? She said, Monday. I said, well, call me on Monday and let's find out what happened. So Monday rolls around about 11 o'clock on Monday. I get a phone call. It's her. She'd been to the eye doctor. Now he had his notes yes. from the Thursday night, Friday morning, because he was the attending physician. He had them right there. He takes the patch off, looks at her and his jaw drops. <laughs> and she said, doctor, what's wrong? And he said, wrong. There's nothing wrong. Wow. And that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, he looked at his notes. He, then he gave her an eye exam. She had a hundred percent, 20, 20 vision out the front and she had a hundred percent peripheral out the side. And he, she, he said, what did you do between Friday and now? She said, 
well, 14 people asked Jesus to heal my eye. Do you think Jesus healed my eye? <laughs> and he said, I don't know Jesus, but your eye is well. And so I said, Tammy, would you tell that to the church? And of course, there's no greater fear than fear of the microphone. You know, this, this girl was, she was terrified of that. She wasn't afraid of other things, but she said, Pastor David, I have never spoken in front of a crowd ever in my life. And I said, well, look, if I give you some questions, could you answer the questions in an interview? She said, I could do that. Just give me the questions. So. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Join the Kingdom Fanatics community. Get exclusive content, green room access with our guests, and more. Visit our website at whogodsays.com. Like and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We greatly appreciate your love and support. To find all information on joining our community, being a guest on the show, donating on our PayPal donation page, and more, visit us at whogodsays.com. Now back to the show. Oh, two, three weeks later, she's in the pulpit, right? And I got a microphone on her and I'm standing next to her, you know, and I'm saying, well, Tammy, what brought you to church? And she did something very sweet. She pointed up at the balcony and there was Grandma Mary. Aww. She said, that's my Grandma Mary. She loves me. She loves all of my relatives. She loves all of us. And we all know that when something goes wrong, we can pray. And Grandma Mary's going to pray. She's going to show up. That's Grandma Mary. Of course, everybody in the church knew. And they're all crying because yeah. Grandma Mary's a sweet lady, you know. And then she said this. And this is the part I didn't know. She said, my little girl, the doctors tried to treat her. She had this terrible wheezing cough and nothing would help. And they sent my child home because there was nothing else they could do. So I called up my grandma Mary and I said, Grandma Mary, is there anybody who could come and pray for my little girl? And then she looked at me and she said, Pastor David, you came and you prayed. Wow. And the little girl fell asleep in your arms and woke up the next day healed. Amen. So I decided that I would come to your church. And when you said, do you want to follow Jesus? I said, well, if Jesus is going to heal my little girl, I'm going to follow Jesus. And that's why I said yes to the claims of Christ that day. Oh of course, by this time, the whole I, I had no clue. I did Again, healing by surprise. I did not know that little girl was in a serious bad way. I did not know that. I just knew the little girl fell asleep in my arms and I put her back in mom's hands. And then... When she got healed, as she told the eye story, by now the whole congregation is weeping and thanking God and praising God. It was the most amazing thing. But the best of all, Grandma Mary, her faith was rewarded. The, the, the praying faith of a praying grandma. Yeah. Everybody in the church understood. Sometimes it's years before the prayer is answered. A Grandma yeah. Mary got to see her prayer answered. Yes. Now, those two accounts started me researching and writing on prayer for healing. And in the course of time, I found myself reducing to writing some of those stories. And I was talking to my good friend, Maxie Dunham, who's the president of Asbury and now a writer. He's written more than 50 books. And, um, and so as Max, and he's now 89 years old, he's still a mentor of mine, a great friend. I just talked to him a couple of days ago. And we pray regularly together. He's a, he's It'll become a great friend. Anyway, Maxie and I decided when I was starting my new ministry, and I, I'm doing a new ministry where I travel and teach. I'm no longer the lead pastor of a local church. I'm now an itinerant and I write and I do podcasts and I and I do videos and I do teaching sessions and conferences and so on. And hey, if anybody wants to invite me, you can go to my website. I, I'm happy to come. We can lock a time that works for all of us. Anyway, in regards to that, when I started this, I called him. I said, well, Maxie, I don't know how to publish on Amazon. Man, I, I want to self-publish a book. And he had produced a little brochure on prayer for healing to train teams to do things at altars in churches. Mm. And I had developed a brochure to train people about how to pay attention to the presence. Yeah. And so our theology was about 100% overlap, but our practices were different. Mm -hmm. And so I said, why don't we put those two things together and do a little book? And we developed a little book called Healing Prayer is God's Idea. And the people at Whitaker House, somebody read it. And they, so, and, and I'll tell you something, this was December of last year. I was calling up Maxie and I said, Maxie, you know, we got 50 pages of book. That's a little too small for a decent book. We need, we need to expand that. He said, David, I was praying about the same thing. Wow. Why don't you start writing and I'll start writing and we'll add some things to this book. So we began writing when Whitaker House contacted us. 
and said, we'd like to pick up your independent book and publish it in our network. And, but can you expand the book? <laughs> <laughs> and we had already sensed oh, the God. Lord telling us that we needed to do that. Yeah. And so the book itself has, um, has a guide for how to pay attention to the movement of the spirit. It teaches about uh, things that you should do when you're doing prayer for healing, things not to pray as well as things to pray, assumptions to make and not to make, how to be aware when you're cooperating with the presence. What does it look like to train a team? And all kinds of stories like the ones we've just told you. In fact, it's also an audio book. And uh, I read most of the audio book, although I'm not allowed to have a lot of fun and laugh a lot. I can, you, have, you have to read your book. You know? so anyway, <laughs> okay. So there's, there's two stories in the book where Maxie reads. One was the healing of his grandson. And so the first chapter, I tell the story that I just told you uh, earlier about the guy with phlebitis mm -hmm. and how he gets healed and how it tripped. And then Maxie tells the story about how his grandson was diagnosed with an eye affliction. His eyes were vibrating back and forth. It's called mm -hmm. nystigmas. And mm -hmm. it means you can't focus properly. And then when the eye doctor examined um, the optic nerve, it was half the size and it was, wow. it looked diseased. It was called optic nerve hyphoplasia, if that nerve name, name, name means anything to you. At any rate, um, his daughter, who was the mother of that child, was in terrible distress. Now, his daughter's married to a medical doctor. Okay, so we're talking about people with medical expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got the diagnosis. They got two or three other people checking this thing out. Now, Maxie Dunham was in charge of the prayer network at the upper room. And so he put out a blast over all of the upper room to get all kinds of people all over the United States and around the world praying for his grandson, Nathan. Now, here's what happened. His daughter, Kim's husband, got a medical scholarship to go to Hartford, Connecticut to learn more things about medicine. And I, I just tell you something. I don't believe any conflict between medicine and miracle. I think the two of them overlap and cooperate. It's like yeah. two roads that are going side by side. And sometimes you're separate and sometimes they overlap. Anyway, right. bottom line is they move to Hartford. And of course, you have to get a new doctor. And they go in to have the child checked and they find an eye doctor who is of good reputation. And of course, they did their homework because this guy's a medical doctor. He knows what questions to ask. Finds a fine one. The guy looks at his eye and says, those eyes are healthy. And then he looks at his optic nerve. Oh, yeah, that optic nerve looked really good. Well, Kim had the file. <laughs> she says to the doctor, you should look at this. So the eye doctor read the file from two other physicians who indicated mm -hmm. number one, nystigmus, and number two, optic nerve hypoplasia. The nystigmus had declined about 95%. It's a little bit there, but hardly there at all. And the optic nerve hypoplasia is gone. And he was told he'd be blind, not be able to see things, that he'd have to sit at the front of the class if he had any eyesight. Wow. Jesus healed those eyes. And here's what happened as we were writing the book. Maxie remembered the story profoundly because his grandson, Nathan, just got married at the time we were writing the book. And now there's a grandchild. So we got the manuscript done and uh, we presented it to Whitaker House. It takes about a year for the book to get off the ground and into their publishing stream. And in that time, there's now a great grandchild. Aww. And the child is healthy. So those two stories start the book. And I read my story, Maxie in his own inimitable way with his Southern accent. He's a Mississippi guy. He, uh, he reads with his Southern accent and it's a beautiful, I, by the way, I love the accent in the North. When you say you plural, it's you guys. When you say you plural in the South, it's y'all. Yes. Y'all. Yep. That's much nicer. <laughs> So that's how all of this started. That's and, amazing. Yes. And so I do believe in the Lord's power to heal. That is amazing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I'm overwhelmed just by listening. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. Uh, I also believe this. I, I, so the book talks about medicine, mm -hmm. miracle, and holy mystery. Mm -hmm. And there are seasons when we don't see the answer. Yes. There are seasons where, in fact, one of the stories in the book is of one of my elders. He was 55 years old when he died of cancer. And he was a wonderful, godly, righteous man. And I prayed for him when he was 51. And he had a remission. 
he also, this, this is hilarious. He, he burst when we were praying with him, there was, there were a bunch of us praying with him. He burst into gales of uproarious laughter. He couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> wow. And we were on a road trip when we'd had the prayer time and I prayed for him and it was a three hour drive home. And we were all together in that. He he laughed for three hours. <laughs> and I said, what you doing? He said, I just can't stop. God is so good. He started laughing. He got all the way home. You know, then his wife took him home. The cancer went into remission. Then three years later, it came back. Now, I'll just tell you something. We, we were friends. He and his wife and my wife and I would do, would do social things together with two other couples. And you got to know something. This guy was always joyful, always yeah. laughing, always teasing. And there was these two guys, him, his name was Bob, and actually his name was Bob Roberts. We used to call him Bob Bobs. <laughs> <laughs> he called himself that. And there was another guy named Bill, and Bill and Bob would do this, you know, this, this fun thing back and forth all night. And we'd laugh together and we'd share meals together. And we'd do a little project together, whatever. We just, they were friends. And he died. I did the funeral. And... He was 55. Yeah. He wasn't 90. He was 55. And I was in such terrible grief. I could yeah. just get myself through this funeral. And, you know, I did the, I don't know if, how you do it down South. We have this saying when the body's going in the ground, into the ground, we commit your ashes, earth to earth, yeah. ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Into God's keeping, we commit our service here to party. I said those words. I did the benediction. I went back into my office, closed the door and cried like a baby. It was my friend. Two weeks after this, the other three couples were getting together and we were sad, but they were celebrating that Bob had been healed. Yeah. I said, healed? He died. God, I just buried him. I just, right. you know, I, and we, he's, he's gone. He, he, I know he's with the Lord. I know he loves Jesus. He's with the Lord, but he's gone. He was 55. And they said, you didn't know him before that prayer time. I said, no, I didn't. Wow. And he said, he was clinically depressed for 12 years and you prayed for him. The cancer went into remission and he burst into laughter and the clinical depression vanished. Wow. And his last four years were oh, filled God. with laughter and love that his wife had not seen in a decade. And I sat back and I said, I did not wow. know that. But I, I'll tell you something, Tashandra, I wanted him well. Yeah, he was the elder in my elder board, and I'll tell you—I don't know if you've ever been in an elder board. Shenanigans, <laughs> <laughs> you know, power deals. You know, somebody's <laughs> mad at you because they said something that offended their grandson. You know that kind of thing. Oh wow! This was the guy who would always say, "What does the Bible say?" And he'd crack open the scripture and he'd read it to us, and then he'd say, "Now you got to repent," and he'd say to somebody else. You were right, and the scripture says you're right. Now we're going to pray and get this thing fixed. He he was that guy. Yeah, he was the one who would keep our elder board with its nose in the Bible. Oh. And so you know, and he was the evangelism guy. He he talked about Jesus to anybody he met. He was always talking about the Lord, right? Yeah. And so it, you know, but I didn't realize he hadn't done that until that prayer time when I was a new pastor wow. in that church. So, I mean, but the, but this is, this, the mystery is still there. I mean, he still died at 55. Yeah. I mean, he, the, he healing, the healing didn't come the way we expected to come. We're like, okay, the problem is cancer. So, Lord, heal him of the cancer. But that's not exactly what he needed. Well, he, the cancer did go into remission. And it went into remission for, and he had no trace of it for three years, and then it returned. Wow. And so, we, so, you have this. So I can't be one of those guys who says everybody's going to get healed all the time. I can't say right, that. Right. I'm old enough to know that that is not truth. Mm -hmm. What I am able to say is that when the power of the Lord starts to move, yes, you is. better cooperate with that. So Ooh. my favorite scripture for this is found in the gospel of Luke. It's Luke five. And uh, in Luke five fifteen, it talks about thousands of people in a crowd because of Jesus' healing ministry. Now, in that culture, they had to walk by foot. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we think about traveling, we get in the car, we drive, you know, and you'd go an hour without much thought. If you have to, get, if you, something is an hour away, you get in the car, you drive, and you, if you need something, you stop at, you know, the the the, the restaurant away. You do that. Yeah. That's not what they could do. If they were going to go more than ten miles, they had to have an animal. They had to take care of the animal. They had to feed it. They had to have water for them and for the animal. They had to have protection. Had to travel in a group. 
And if they were bringing a sick person, they had to bring things that would make the sick person well. And if they can't, and it says in Luke 5, 15, they were coming from countries. Yes. So weeks of travel at a time to meet Jesus, the healer. Now there were thousands of them. Luke 12 says there were so many people outside, they were stepping on each other. Wow. That's a lot of people. Now, um, it says, uh, I'll, now I just gave his hint from my, if anything in my church ever grew, my elders would always say, do more of it. <laughs> <laughs> Need a Sunday school class? Add another one. That's you got your, your Sunday school, your church is full? Add a second service. Add a third service. Do more of it. And the prayer principle sometimes got swallowed up mm. in the growth principle. Yeah. Now in 515, it says thousands came because of his healing ministry. In 516, it says that Jesus would go off by himself to pray yes. alone. Yes. And so he didn't just automatically do more. He would seek his father in the private prayer place mm. before he did more. Now in 517, it describes what it was like. Now here's the background. In Luke's gospel, Luke chapter one, verse one admits he was not an eyewitness, mm. but he talked to eyewitnesses and he gathered data to com compile a gospel. That's what he says. That means Luke was talking to someone who was there yeah. in Luke 5, 17. He got that. So one of the disciples or somebody in the crowd, maybe the healed guy, he was gathering the research and Luke was a medical doctor. Okay. Yes. Now it says this, it says that there were people from all around that came from Jerusalem, Judea, that came from all the outlying villages. And then it says this thing in the last line of 517. And the power of the Lord was present for Jesus to perform healing. Mm. Here's what it means. Luke wrote that down because somebody saw that. Mm. You got it? Yeah. There was an increase in manifest presence. It lands on Jesus. Yeah. And then he cooperates with the spirit on him. And the paralyzed man is healed. Yes. Now that text is powerful and rich for lots and lots of reasons. The big one for me is that it was Jesus himself, who is God, the son and the son of God right. had come to earth as the son of man. Mm -hmm. And in his earthly humanity, he had to pay attention to the increase of the presence yes. to cooperate with what the father was doing. And in John's gospel, he admits it It's all the way through John's gospel. Luke five, John five rather tells, tells of the healing of the guy at the pool of Bethesda. One of my favorite stories. So the guy's sick 38 years, that's a long time. And he gets healed. I mean, listen, that means he was sick at 12. Mm -hmm. Jesus heals him when he's 50 mm. and he's never worked a day in his life. That means he has no skills. He doesn't know how to wait on customers. He doesn't know how to handle a tool. Never dug a ditch in his life. Somebody else has fed him. Somebody else has washed him. Somebody else has got his clothes on him, taking him to that pool every day to wait for the stirring of the waters. Yeah. So Jesus says to the guy, do you want to be healed? Mm -hmm. I always thought that was a dumb question. <laughs> but think about it. If you never worked for a living for 38 consecutive years, do you want to start from the beginning when you're 50? I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. I just, no I don't so know. Jesus asks him, and he, and he says, I can't get to the pool. You're going to help me in the pool. And, and so the Lord says, pick up your bed and walk. Now, the funny thing about that story, the guy doesn't know who Jesus is. <laughs> he's, it's, it's an anonymous healing. He's, he gets well. And, yeah. and so he's carrying his bed on the Sabbath. The Pharisees get mad. And they say, what are you doing carrying that bed on Sabbath? He said, well, some guy. Some guy. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know it's Jesus. Anyway. In the course of time, the Lord walks up to him and says, that was me. And my name is Jesus. And then uh, he tells the Pharisees and the Pharisees say, why did you do that? Why did you break those rules on the Sabbath? And it's actually a bit hilarious. Uh, <laughs> Jesus pokes his finger in their eye. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The God you, whose rule you invented to keep. Uh, he's the God who told me to break your rule. <laughs> and then, then he says this amazing phrase. I can do nothing unless I see what the Father is doing. Yeah. 
And he describes this experience of seeing something before he heals the man. So here's that phrase again, God initiates, we respond. And you become consciously aware of the presence of the power of the Lord and you cooperate with it. And you become aware as, as and so I'll just, I'll just return to this personally. When I am in that, I am utterly unable to do anything else. You focus on the person you're praying for and you shut out everything else. You have just no time for anything else because you're present to the person and to the presence. Yeah. You become aware that the power of God is growing inside of you. Your mind gets focused and you see the person in need and you sense the anointing of the spirit inside of you and around you and the flow of the presence and you cooperate with that. And sometimes you tangibly feel the anointing going into the other and they, they, and sometimes they respond a little bit. And what, what I, what I tell people to do in the book is you cooperate with the presence. And so if you see small improvement, you pray for the presence to expand. You pray for the power to grow. And the the Old Testament, magnify the Lord with me, make him bigger. Psalm 34, Uh, you know, magnify your your name, exalt your name, manifest your name, those kinds of things. Those prayers are biblical. You pray for an increase in the presence while the presence is on you. And what I do is I ask the person what's going on inside of them while the prayer is happening. Jesus does that. In the Gospel of Mark, there's a man who see who Jesus prayed for who was blind. He puts mud in his eyes, and then the mud goes, and Jesus says to him, what do you see? He said, oh, I see men, but they're walking around like trees. So Jesus of Nazareth, God the Son, prays a second time yeah. until his sight is completely restored. We have this little window into Jesus having an interview with the person he was healing. In fact, that happens in, in the casting out of the uh, of the demon and the demonized boy in Mark 9. He talks to the dad about what's happened to the boy in the past. He doesn't talk to the boy. He talks to the dad. How long has this been going on? What does it look like? And the dad tells him, and then he casts the demon out, and he, he heals a lad. Anyway, it looked like he had epilepsy or some combination in combination with demonization married together in the two in that narrative. It's one of the few where the two things come together. Mm. But regardless of that, uh, I can just tell you that I, it's been a lifelong, since that moment where yeah. I prayed for that man with phlebitis, I have journaled about prayer for healing and how it works. And in the course of my ministry, I've had these moments where the Lord has interrupted my day. Thank you very much. And made me do something I didn't want to do. <laughs> Pray for somebody's healing. Because I'm still kind of shy about it. Right. I'm not, I, listen, I don't know about you, Tyshandra. I, I'm not Jesus of Nazareth. Every now and then I have this illusion that I'm greater than I really am. But it lasts until, you know, the kid gives you a hard time or the dog acts up or something. Yeah. And, or, I, or you, I know you I'm not a horrible thought, you know, and then, then you sin in your head. You think some ugly thought right after that. Then you realize you're just not God. <laughs> <laughs> and you have no pretension to be God either. You're a servant of the living God. That's what you are. Ooh, I know I'm not God because when I drive, I just be like, you know, see, if, if I was God, the world would have been over just based off traffic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, when you're driving, you pray, oh, God, don't let that guy hit me over there. Ooh, That's what you're doing. Yeah. The prayers yeah. go up when I'm driving. Ooh. Yes, they do. But I, I just want to touch on, you said that when you get overwhelmed by the presence um, and, and you want to, God initiates and we have to respond. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's a little bit. I don't know. For me, it was kind of crazy because I didn't really know what was going on. I, I experienced um, the urge of healing. Yep. I guess I would say an urge. Um, my my great niece was hit by a car recently, like last year. Yes. And um, it was right after my dad had passed in the hospital. And my uh, my sister called. She was like, are you going to go see her in the hospital? And I would ask them, you know, how she's doing, how how they're right doing, because I didn't want to go. I didn't. I just, you know, I was there with my dad. I watched him take his last breath. You know, I didn't want to go into yeah, the, the hospital. Was too fresh, huh? it's, it's yeah, too and I didn't know how I was going to react. So I was like, I didn't really want to go in the hospital. And um, my my niece, her mom called and said, "Well, she asked for you." And I was like, "Oh, okay. <laughs> that mean I gotta go. <laughs> okay." So. 
finished up work and everything. And I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll come after work. I got in my car and I started driving. And I don't know what happened, but I just kept saying, I got to touch her. 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 That's Bible. Uh, you, I'll, I'll open that up after you finish your story, but that's, that's Bible. Carry on. I, I just, yeah. it over and over and over. It was a repetitive thought. I didn't think about anything else. I couldn't, I, I literally got in my car and drove to the hospital yep. without, like, I know I was driving, but I can't tell you where I turned, where I made a right turn, left turn or whatever. Like I was so zoned out that I just almost floated to the hospital and I walked in and I was talking to her mom and she was like, well, um, they said that she, um, she had damage to her hip, her leg, her head, her, her arm. And, um, because of the hip damage, she wasn't going to be able to get out the bed for about six weeks. Okay. And then after that, they'll be able to start physical therapy. Yep. Um, and so I was like, okay. And my mom was there and my mom kind of um, was getting in her little, oh my God, my baby. And, you know, <laughs> you know kissing on her and stuff. Yes. Okay. And so um, I just walked up to her. I was like, how you feeling? Are you okay? She said, I'm okay. I'm okay. And I touched her head. Yep. And she had uh, stitches in the top part. I didn't see them because of her hair, but she had stitches right here in the top part of her head. And I touched her head and she started crying. Yeah. And I said, are you okay? And she said, yeah. She was like, I have stitches right here. And I said, it's going to be okay. She said, it's going to be okay. I said, it's going to be okay. She said, it's going to be okay. And uh, I stayed there for a little while. Because once she told me that she had stitches and, and everything, I moved my hand. But I stayed in the hospital for a little while, like a, maybe a couple of hours. And um, before I left out the hospital, she got out the bed. Now, did you pray? I I don't know what happened. Okay. I don't know what was said. All I remember asking her was, are you okay? Now, in the scripture, Jesus was not praying when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. And power was on him. And it says in the text, it's Mark 5. Mm-hmm. It says that the woman felt in her body that she was healed and that Jesus felt the flow of power. And in Mark, it's very clear, he is walking away from her when she touches him from behind. Yeah. So he was not aware who it was, and it was a crowd of thousands pressing in on him. And there was a transfer of power. And in other parts in Luke and in Mark, it talks about how they put the sick in pallets. And when he would walk by, they would just touch him, and power was coming from him. Yeah. It says that in the Sermon on the Plain, just before... He gives the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. And so we have those accounts where his prayer life led to a manifest presence on him that was accessed by touch. Now, that word touch in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's used something like 50 times. With the exception of Jesus touching the children to bless them, which I think could have also had a transfer of power, and the account of Jesus touching a lamp to light it, All of the references have to do with the transfer of healing virtue from Jesus to the recipient of healing prayer, either with the person praying or with Jesus praying or both. Every single reference. And sometimes Jesus is consciously aware and sometimes he was not. But it had, but you were, you were commanded. I can just tell you this. Most of Jesus talking, most of God's talking is nonverbal. Yeah. It's a sense of manifest presence that grows. And you were commanded by presence to start driving that car. And you were commanded to go into that room. And you were commanded to put your hand on that head, even though you did not want to be there. <laughs> so once again, this healing by surprise is the best way to describe that. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, you know, you didn't do that. I know. And I you know, the medical team didn't do that. They told I you. Know. No, no, no. They, yeah, they say it's six that. weeks. Yeah, Jesus did that. Yeah. And so the bottom line is, you couldn't claim glory for that. The medical team didn't want the glory for that. They were concerned. And the child was walking. That's the Lord. 
I, I was and like, God gets, so here's the thing. You don't get the glory. The, the team doesn't get the glory. God does. And that's how gifts of the spirit work. Whenever the power of the Lord shows up on you, he gets the glory. Yes. That's how it works. I am so grateful that you came on today. Any last words for the audience? Well, yes, actually, you can get that book anywhere books are sold. I'm going to show it again so if I could do mm-hmm. that. It's called Healing Prayer is God's Idea. That's what it looks like. It's a co-write between myself, David Chotka, and Maxie Dunham. But you can just Google Healing Prayer and you'll find it. It just came out by Whitaker House. And it's on audiobook, it's on ebook, and it's trade paperback. And you can get it. You can go to Walmart and order the thing if you want to, or Barnes and Noble, or Books a Million, or anything like that. Anywhere books are sold, the book's available. And it walks through some of the stories I've told you. I've told you a couple of ones that aren't in the book, but stories just like that are there, together with the principles that arise from those stories mm-hmm. about how to do that in your church. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, I'm going to let you go, but I want to thank you again. For, All right. For well, let me pray a blessing on your audience. Could I do that? Yes, and then we'll call yes, that today. Yes. Okay. Lord Jesus, I'm aware that right now somebody out there is sick. Somebody out there has their sick relative. Somebody out there doesn't know what to do. And they're wondering if they're supposed to be involved in prayer for healing. So Jesus, here's the prayer I would pray. I would pray you speak nonverbal and take control of their body and put them in that car and get them. <laughs> get them driving down the road. Yes. Or that you surprise them by showing up inside their hearts, their minds, their souls, their spirits, and flow through them. I would pray that their hearts would overflow with compassion as they pray for another, or that those who are afflicted would have friends and relatives come and love on them, place their hands on them, and in Jesus' name, be the agent of the love of God. Send consolation, send grace, send mercy, send blessing. Bless Tyshandra as she does this podcast. Let it speak to many, and let it turn the hearts of many toward the Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tyshandra. It's been a joy to be with you. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Very good. God bless. Bye for now. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today on the Who God Says podcast with your host and Kingdom Ambassador, Tyshandra. Go to whogodsays.com to join the mailing list for episode premieres upcoming guests and more send in your questions to be a part of the show at who God says at gmail.com and don't forget join the kingdom fanatic community until next time be blessed and also be a blessing